Right. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Garden Valley. I am glad you're here. This has been an incredibly busy, busy week. Um, we got a lot done. God was good. Um, we, uh, if you hadn't noticed, we have heat registers pretty high on the wall. That's actually air conditioning and heat. Um, yes. The we uh, we spent. Part of the week working on that uh, north side heating it's a uh, from the car wash and cobble they kind of go kitty corner across the road they were incredibly nice they've been out here numerous times and um, they assessed what we needed and and I, I'm going to put a TV up in that corner so Jana can have the words to whatever you're doing we can't see what you're doing from up here so I was gonna put a little TV on the wall but the north side wired in a plug-in for us for our TV so we can make that happen so anyway, so we have heat, we have air conditioning. I know, this is good. And everything I've just talked about is covered by donations. Uh, we didn't take any money out of the church budget. Um, it was all 100% paid for beforehand, um, including uh, including the guy that's coming in to do the sheet rocking. All that's paid for by donations. Uh, so yeah, God is, God is just good. He's taking care of Garden Valley. Um, sometimes God uses odd things to get your attention and uh, this was I don't know probably close to 10 years ago um, it was a, kind of in a difficult time in my ministry and uh, I was there were a lot of things I was wrestling with and uh, the Mo or the Moos, the um, Kingsburys come to our church. They work a lot on Sundays, but when they can, they're here. And uh, Mama Kingsbury bought me a coffee cup that just said, Man of God on it. And she would be shocked. I've never told her how much that bothered me. It, it kind of, you know, I, I found it very uncomfortable. I was like, you know, but it was a good coffee cup, so I hung on to it. And, um, and time went on, and I hung on to that cup, and I put it on my desk when I was studying, and uh, it, it, it brought me to a, I found it terribly humbling. I found that the, the stupid coffee cup bothered me for some reason, and, and God was using it to um, impact my perspective. And uh, so then that cup died. It, I don't know, I lost it. You know, like all great coffee cups get lost. And so um, so somebody here in the church bought me this one and left and gave it to me for Christmas, I remember. It was uh, Second Chronicles, or Second Chronicles. Yeah, you got me doing it, Calvin. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4. It says, he comforts us in our troubles so we are able to give others comfort. And I have been packing this thing around for years. And uh, I keep reading that verse and reading that verse and reading the verse. And... Um, I, apparently there's a coffee cup ministry to Pastor Shane, and uh, I have. Uh, uh, this is one of the verses that has impacted me. Um, sometimes, those of us with very thick skulls, God uses uh, some slow meditation techniques to sink things in and impact us. Right. So on the screen over my head, I've got praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Now, this is one of those blanket verses that impacts everybody in the room. Everybody in this room, God has allowed life experiences, has allowed lessons, teaching, reading, make a list. You have been individually designed to minister to other people in their point of need. Um, as I go through this, there's things that I find incredibly relevant for me. Um, whether it be military, um, I have a very natural compassion for those serving in the military, those who have served in the military. I'm actually a VSO officer. I'm a service officer for uh, the VFW. So when they have vets that come to them that are having a lot of troubles in any capacity, they refer them to me. I'm their contact person and they get hold of me and then I'll meet with them and assess where they're at and what they need and I'll get them hopefully the help that they best need to accommodate. It just opens doors. I am able to comfort the vets because I walk where they're walking. Um, I've spent years in law enforcement, years in jail. 
as a correction staff. Um, I had to clarify that. I, I made a joke about that a couple weeks ago where I spent 20 years in jail and nobody really, I don't think, understood. I was talking about which side of the bars I was serving on. <laughs> so I thought maybe I should just clarify this. I was, because I was on the outside of the bars, but the guys inside the bars had better health insurance than I did. Um, in fact, theirs was free. Um, but anyway, so I, I find that like law enforcement will reach out to me. Spent years as an EMT in an ambulance so that I, with e EMS, fire. I find people reach out to me. Why? Because I have been there. I have suffered. I've been through the battles. I've suffered the, the, the pain of these different careers, these different experiences. And that is where I'm at. That is what I'm experiencing. God allowed me to take a class at Moody Bible Institute where they spent the whole semester talking about nothing but funerals. The guy was a master. Uh, he, he did at least a funeral a week in Spokane. He spent uh, a whole semester doing nothing but teaching us guys how to do funerals, how to meet people's needs. Meet them where they're at, assess what they need, and companion them. Walk alongside them in the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, this stuff is invaluable. So as I'm ministering to people, what does this do? I am able to take this verse and I understand this because the things that I have struggled with, the things this morning, had a family get a hold of me whose church is going through a church split. Why? Because they need counsel. They need godly insight. They want to know where God wants them to be, where their heart should be. So my point of bringing all this to the front is, you look at your life, look at what God has done in your life, what He has allowed you to suffer, what He has allowed you to go through. Um, we had a lady in our church years ago, went through a really difficult time in her life. It was, it was very dark, and um, I walked through this with her, and I remember we, we sat right here after church one Sunday, and she's weeping, and she's like, I don't understand how God would allow this to happen to me. And uh, I just told her, I said, think about this. I said, God is allowing you to go through this, and I was thinking about this verse, God is allowing you to go through this darkness to prepare your heart so that you're going to be prepared to minister to other women that go through this darkness. You're going to be able to minister to them in a way that I can't. I told her, I says, I am happy to sit down with them and happy to share the Word of God and happy to pray with them, but I says, you have a heart for them because God is comforting you in a very special way. Is that awesome? That is what this verse is teaching here. And if I had to pick one thing that I think people are really struggling with today is the goodness of God. Is God good? You know, the generations past, they struggled, struggled with, is there even a God? You know, they, they did the whole question about whether there's a God. Well, now the question, I think, has shifted to, is God good? Is He good? They say, you know, you acknowledge there's a God. So... She does not like this sermon. <laughs> she has had enough. It's, so, so think about this. The question is, is, is God good? And who is God? And what is He like? And so here's the deal. People want to know, people in the world want to know what God is like. So what do they do? They look at you and me. We're His followers. We carry the name Christian. When they look at us, what are they doing? They're looking at us saying, okay, what is God like? And he looks at Randy and people are saying, well, that's what God's like. He's got their attributes. He made us in his image. We became new creatures in Christ. What? Old things have passed away. All things have become new. He's created us to be a new creature in Christ. And so what happens here? People look at us and that is our witness. What is a witness? A witness is someone that has observed, experienced an event and goes to court to testify what they personally experienced, right? We experience God. We have a relationship with God. We are close to God. We know who He is. He has touched our lives and we recognize that. And so what happens? When, when people look at us, we should be His witnesses. So the question is this, what do people see when they rub up against us? Do they see comfort? Now, by the way, our great example is always Jesus, right? Jesus is always our example. So when we look at Jesus, we say, is my life revealing the attributes of his life? How he handled people. Is that how I myself, I mean, do they, they're talking about comfort here. When people draw close to me, do I bring them comfort? So here's where it gets tasty. Because 
when people come to me and they need comfort, what is my role? What is my job as a Christian? Read the very first two lines of this passage. Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. What? The Father of compassion. You and I know the source of compassion. That is what God, God is a source. He wants us to be compassionate with other people as they travel through their pain. And what? He says, give them comfort. Well, what does that look like? Well, let me tell you something. If you read right on the front of your hand out there, right in the middle, I gave you two quick just definitions, affliction and comfort. Affliction just means trouble. You already knew that. It's suffering, tribulation. There's a hundred synonyms here that can come into play. So affliction, that is the trouble that comes into your life. And I realize that, you know, with the exception of Kevin, who has no trouble in his life, the rest of us struggle with some stuff. There are things that are going to, you know, our pond is not rippleless. You know, we got things that, but what? Comfort. So what is comfort? Don't miss this. Comfort is the strength to endure trouble. How? By relying 100% on God. And that is good. That, that, that you should hang on to. Because often, now I'm, uh, I'm being transparent here. I like people. I enjoy being around people. And oddly enough, and I don't mean this weird, I like being around people that are working through hard things. I like being around people that are very honest, that are struggling with something, and they're willing to put it on the table and say, I don't know what to do with this, and walk with me through this event. I, w I, I find great satisfaction in like, being encouraging and comfort and a rock for people that are dealing with some tough stuff. I like that. I mean, I do this. The question is, when people come to me with a, with a heartache, when they come to me with something they're struggling with, it's easy to tell them what they want to hear to pacify their pain. I don't like <laughs> our friend. We were in the ER the other day. I'm going to tell a story and she won't care. <laughs> so she's got a bad nosebleed. They can't make it quit bleeding. They've already put a, what they call a tampon up her nose to keep her nose from bleeding. Pull it out. It's not, it isn't working. So they get a bigger one. You know, and that, that rascal's that long, mm -hmm. however long that is, and they, they got nurses holding her down and they put it up her nose mm -hmm. all the way to where it's gone. And I'm like, I'm like tears running down my cheeks and I am not happy. And she's not happy. And I'm like, now we know why I'm not working in the ER anymore. That was <laughs> awful. And so, I, I, so I'm looking at, I'm very, very compassionate now, you know, to, to, to this kind of thing. When I'm looking at this, she is suffering an affliction. So what is my role in this? My role, matter of fact, I spent a lot of time, we spent hours together. As we're spending time together, I need to draw her closer to God. That's right. Whatever physical things going on, whatever's being required of her, whatever, my role is to introduce her, to draw her close, to remind her that God is good, God knows where she is, He knows who she, He knows what's happening here, and to provide her. And in that case, I believe the comfort that He was providing her is just me sitting there holding her hand. The people that you minister to may not need a sermon. Okay, it's easy to just dump information on people. It's easy to say, well, here's what the Bible says. And dump, but sometimes people need a hug. Sometimes people need you to hold their hand. Sometimes we call it companioning. That's <coughs> yeah, listen to them. Just just let them pour out their hearts in honesty in a non judgmental environment. One of the things that we have learned is it's dangerous. Uh, by the way, this is an interesting study. It's dangerous when you come alongside somebody and you get in front of them and you lead them because you're taking them maybe where they don't need to go. Is leading them, you're taking them where you need to go when you have a problem, but that may not be what they need in their moment, right? And so then there's also a danger coming along somebody behind you that will push you. And so when you're in trouble, when you're struggling, when you're having a dark moment, a dark day, it's easy to have somebody behind you that is pushing. Now, none of you know anybody like this that has an opinion and an agenda. And they say, well, you've been grieving for, you know, two months. That's enough. Get over yourself and start pushing and try, you know, get back to your normal life. Start moving. And what happens is your heart isn't where their heart is. We have found companioning is where you come alongside somebody. And all you're going to do is you're going to listen and love and not be judgmental. And you're going to share, draw them close to God when they need to be close to God. And what you're doing, you're providing them the comfort that God has to afford them. But a lot of that comfort is just being present. 
You're just being present. You're allowing them <coughs> to not walk alone through the valley of the shadow of death. The Psalm 23 promises what? Psalm 23 promises that when you travel through the deep, dark valley, when you travel through that valley, you're not going to travel alone. The God will go with you. The good shepherd will travel with you. We get that, but we can't see the good shepherd. He's there, and I have 100% faith that he's there, but sometimes my faith has taken such a beating. Sometimes their faith is so shaken. Their faith is so... They're just in a dark, dark place. They need a representative of God to walk alongside them through the deep, dark valley. They need a rep. What is that? They call them Christians. Followers of Jesus. Why? This verse explains all this. This verse explains, hey, listen, listen. He, all I want you to do is be compassionate. I want you to recognize where they are. I want you to just validate them. I want you to love them unconditionally. So what are we doing here? We're going to offer them comfort in their troubles. Now listen, one of the things that I, I am, I try to be terribly humble because I think this is important. When I comfort somebody, once in a while I'll recognize this is beyond my expertise. This is beyond my training. This is beyond my, my gifting. This is not where God has gifted me. And what I will do then is I will refer them to somebody that does have this gift, that does have that experience. You know why? Because I want to provide them the best compassion, the best comfort possible. And I am not a handle that fits every, you know, every tool. I recognize that. And so sometimes I'll be, especially with vets, when I'm working with vets, I'll sit down and I'll listen to them. I listened to one the other day and uh, met him at Rancho Chico's. That's where all great ministry takes place. <laughs> yeah, all great, all great experiences I've had in the ministry takes place at Rancho Chico's. And, uh, you know... I'm sorry. And so um, we're sitting there, and he's pouring out his heart, and he's telling me what he's dealing with. And I recognize he is light years beyond what I have resources for. I am not the guy. So I gave him a business card for the one that is the guy. I gave him a, a couple phone numbers of people that can follow up that when he's not sure anything's happening that he could talk. Why? I'm providing him comfort in that situation. As a pastor, by the way, this comfort thing could be tricky. Then I fall back on Ephesians. Ephesians says you must speak the truth in love. You speak truth with compassion. Why? If you speak truth without compassion, you're cruel. If you speak truth without compassion, you alienate and you kill the message. They will never hear the message if the delivery is harsh. Like rubbing their nose in it. You're rubbing your nose in it. Yeah, that's he says, speak the truth. Don't water the truth down. If you speak if you speak compassion without truth, we call that compromise. And that, that doesn't bring people closer to God. It doesn't bring them into a place of health. If you speak without truth, you are not being honest with them. Proverbs has a lot to say about, you know, the the the, the kisses of an enemy. <laughs> you know, we're talking about you're better to have somebody tell you the truth, but you speak the truth in love. And I have thousands of hours of illustrations of this. Um, I have walked with people through darkness, and I have shared truth with them in, in a way that was palatable, in a way that they could understand it, in a, in a way that the Word of God was... In, I, I, sometimes you do it in small doses. You take a small spoon. Why? Because... The Spirit of God is going to take the seed and work with it. I can't do that. I'll take the Word of God, I'll put it in their heart, I'll put it in their mind, and then let them chew on that a while. And By the way, I didn't come by that being a smart guy. I had a, uh, they call it pastoral counseling. It was a four-year class that we took in the Bible college. In a pastoral counseling, I remember the instructor had a very strong opinion, who had spent his whole life a pastor. And so he would get up and frequently say, listen, when people come to you for counsel, they do not want your counsel, they want your validation. They already know what they want to do, and all they want you to do is say, okay, do that. And if you, if you tell them that, you know, you're doing that compromise thing. He said, you're better off to say, well, the Word of God says this, and then stop. Keep it short. Say, this is what the Bible says. Let them walk out the door. And if God brings them back, now get serious about it. 
He says, then, you know, maybe God is doing a work in their heart and you need to work with us. But he says, you need to give them the word of God. Why? Because God is a source of comfort. God is a source of guidance. God is a source of joy, the source of peace, all these things. I've made you a whole list of things on here. Clearly, I don't have time to go through all of it. And basically what I did is I just set up my computer. It says, God allows trouble to happen when... God allows trouble to happen too. Sorry. And I gave you a list of seven things. And uh, I tried to give you some verses. There's a lot of verses that can blend in here. If you, and by the way, you should consider these things. You should meditate on these things. Ponder these. Why would God allow trouble to happen to you? If I don't have troubles in my life, how can I minister if somebody else is going through the same thing? You, you just quoted the scripture. Amen. God will allow the trouble to happen to me, and it will give me the, the honor of walking with them when they are struggling. Like taking you to school. Remember that old story, you know, don't, don't criticize me till you've walked a mile in my shoes. Yeah. Oh, I, I made you a list of seven things here. Go through these at home. Flip your little paper over. Flip your paper over. At the very top, I gave you maybe you want to... I have, like, some quotes... So when I die, you can present them at my funeral, okay? I have Shane-isms. Um, this is one. God never wastes a hurt. If you are hurt, go back to this verse. God is preparing you for ministry. If you, He's allowing you to travel into a hurt, into some darkness, He is increasing your faith. He's teaching you who He is. He's going to bring you out the other side. And He will not waste a hurt. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. James chapter 1. Count it all joy when you're experiencing dark days. Amen? Um, and by the way, I was just working through this verse. Um, <coughs> actually, the verse before it, verse 3 says, I'll praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father. So I talked about mercy there at the top. God comforts us in our affliction. Mercy. We're going back to compassion. As a believer in Christ, and by the way, I can't ask myself if I'm compassionate because I'm really close to the forest. <laughs> it's hard to, what would Proverbs say? Solomon wrote, he that seeks counsel from his own heart is a fool, right? So if I say, Shane, how are you doing in the whole compassion area? I'm like, I rock. But you ask my wife. <laughs> she tends to be pretty honest about things. So my point is this. God is merciful. He is full of compassion. The closer you get to God, the more His attributes will rub off on you. The closer, by the way, a, a, I think a great illustration of this is a guy named Jesus. Think about this. Jesus, what did He do? Jesus came to earth to love, live, and die for people that hated Him. He forgave people that didn't ask for forgiveness. He forgave people that hated him. He forgave the very people that were putting him on a false trial, torturing him and killing him publicly. He forgave. So when I look at this is my standard. This is the level of compassion. That means God is calling me to show compassion on people that I don't like. Hard for me to be around. God wants me to demonstrate the depths of my faith, the depths of my walk with Him. God wants me to demonstrate, and by the way, everybody in here has a face that just flashed through their mind. I do too. That one person God wants me to forgive, the person God wants me to show compassion to, and I don't want to. Yeah. That's uh, my Christianity growing. God growing my faith. All right, keep it moving here. Second check mark there. God, that does not mean that God will remove the trouble. I had to put this in there. I think it was important. Listen, everybody experiences trouble. And how often when we pray, do we say, pray and say, God, Rita has a thing and I want you to remove it. <laughs> well, the truth is, the thing that she's traveling through, God is allowing her to travel through it to prepare her for a service or to increase her faith or to deal with something he once dealt with. And he, if he didn't want her to have it, she wouldn't have it. He's a pretty big God. He's pretty capable. No, it, Linda forwarded that to me. Did you? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes. God, God knew where she was at. He knew what she was going through. Allowed her to go through it. And as she comes out the other side, she will come forth as gold, the Bible says. Yeah. I love that. 
that refining process. But that just because I pray about it doesn't mean God's going to remove it right then and there. It's not like I'm going to go over there, put my hand on your head and say, you're done. It's finished. No. God has a plan. And what's important then when I pray, I need to pray in tandem with God's will. I need to pray that God, I need you to broaden Read the shoulders. Broad, lend the shoulders. Is they bear the burden you've called them to bear in this season. And by the way, I love this. In the Old Testament, when you read through the Old Testament, what does it say? And it came to pass in those days that the Babylonians rose up and just smacked the dog out of the Israelites, right? Or you'll read along and say, and the Assyri- God, and it came to pass. The Assyrians rose up and and it came to pa- and it came to pass. But it never says it came to stay. They yeah. intended it for harm, but God intends it for the good. They intended it for harm, and God intended it for good. Amen. This, I think there are layers of truths in here run very deep. Very deep. Listen, when you are going through the valley of the shadow, and when all of a sudden you recognize the fact that things are really dark, you recognize that, and remember, and it came to pass. It did not say. <coughs> to quote one of my dad's great authors... A scholar of yesteryear, a guy named Louis Lamore. One of my yes, one of my dad's favorite books was a, a cowboy named Passing Through. Yeah, he just passing through. That's it. We pass through the deep dark valley. We pass through. God says, "Listen, it's tough. We're not going to stay there." Like with Joseph, I always like to say, wherever he went, whatever trouble he was with, <laughs> always said, "But God was with him." But God was with him. Uh, uh, Joseph is a great illustration of this whole sermon. Joseph. Was God, and when he was a teenager, God told him he was going to lead. He was going to be a great man, and God had a great plan for his life. And as Joseph is faithful, he's doing his best. He's fought, and all of a sudden, he winds up in prison for 15 years. Joseph is in prison for something he didn't do, for something he was innocent of. And now all of a sudden, I think about Joseph. I'm like. He's sitting in jail. This is going to look bad on his resume. When he applies to be pastor of the next church, they're going to look at that and say, you just did 15 years in jail for sexual assault, Joseph. You're not, no, we don't want you. You know what that would do to our insurance. And he is never going to get a job. (coughs) He never, and so all of a sudden, God never forgot him. God, God knew the truth. God knew what he was going through. And what? He was suffering terrible. And for 15 years, God worked in Joseph's heart to bring him to a place to where he could provide comfort to his brothers that sold them into slavery in the first place. Oh, does that tell you a lot about the heart of Joseph? If I was Joseph and my brothers that sold me into slavery, that destroyed my life and lied to my father about what happened to me, I would want them... So I would want to smite them on the head <laughs> repeatedly. Yes, I, but what? Joseph spent 15 years with God, walking with God in prison, and God softened his heart to where Joseph was able to forgive and provide comfort to his brothers that had done him wrong. Is that amazing? Yes, he was going through, and it came to pass, but he didn't come to stay. God lifted him up. Oh, man. Oh, I got the whole page on the back. We're going to be here another hour. Hope you're okay with that. So how to receive comfort. I'm going to touch this quickly. They're right in the middle. How to receive comfort from God. That was the heart of this whole sermon. The first one is by faith. And by the way, the secret to number one, the secret to it is do you know God and do you know what he is like? Do you know him? The secret is that is the basis of your faith. That is your foundation. If you believe that God is good, And by the way, if you do not know a lot about God, that tells me you need to spend some time reading His Word. I tried to sprinkle verses in here. Not enough. The Bible is full of things that reveals who God is. And if you want to have faith, you need to know you trust Him. A hundred years ago, um, I I was set up on a blind date. And uh, I met Michelle on a blind date. And um, I took her to Spokane to see the first Batman movie with Michael Keaton. And, um, and I took her to Rocky Morocco's. I took her to Rocky Morocco's and I bought a meat lover's pizza. My wife hates meat lover's pizzas and she hates action movies. Can't stand Batman. She would not go out with me again. That was a one shot deal, one and done. Didn't return my phone calls. 
<laughs> Finally, a friend of ours set, set us up and pleaded with her, and I think he, she bribed her with a steak. If you eat a steak, you know, anyways. We ended up being married for 30 years here, you know, but it took a while. I had a point to that. Oh, number one, by faith. <laughs> I got so distracted by my great illustration, I couldn't remember what I was talking about. I learned a lot about my wife, my future wife, by what? Spending time with her. I had experiences. I spent time with. I paid attention to. Do you want to know how to get to know God? Spend time with, have experiences with, and pay attention to. You have a problem that big right there. And all of a sudden you're like, man, this is horrible, it's awful. And the next day God took care of it, and you're like, hmm. Oh, that was interesting. Next day it's a little bigger problem. And you're like, well, God took me through the last one, but this one's a lot bigger. What? What you pray for reveals to me your heart. How you pray for things. Sometimes we only pray for things because... We're not sure if he's actually going to show up. We're not sure if he's going to do what we want him to do. We're not sure how God is going to handle this thing in my life. And so we're very careful how we pray for something. I can kind of assess your knowledge of God and how close you are to God by how you pray. Do you trust him? Are you able to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? And I am going to thank you in the storm. I am going to thank you no matter how you handle this. I'm going to thank you no matter what the end result is because I, I know you're always good. If you're able to pray that, that's like college level Christianity because that's hard. Letting go and trusting him, but you can only do that if you know him. That's the faith part. Second one, through the word of God. The word of God, Romans 10, 17 says, and faith comes by, by, hearing. by hearing and hearing by the... So number one and number two is actually one point. But, you know, I had some extra room on my paper and I needed to make it look longer. So I gave you two, two points here. So, <clears throat> so number two, you study the Word of God, your faith increases. You study the Word of God, you get to know God. And then three, God's Spirit residing in you ministers to your heart. The Spirit of God in your heart reminds you, what is He doing? <coughs> he is going to remind you of the Word of God that you've read. You read the Word of God this morning at breakfast, and now in the day you suffer, you're, you're struggling with something, and the Spirit of God say, didn't you read? Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 says, one of my favorite all-time verses, you intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Is that awesome? Joseph told his brothers, he said, you did the worst that you could do to me. You intended it for evil. You intended to kill me, to destroy my life. And God took the very worst that you could throw at me and turned it around to make something good out of it. Is that awesome? So anyway, the Word of God and then the Spirit of God blesses number two. And then the fourth one. Boy, this is a big one. Welcome from others. You should have people. Matter of fact, being transparent, um, a few years ago, um, church is in going through a tough time. I was going through a tough time. It was it was a it was a learning experience for Pastor Shane. And so what did I do? I gathered people that I trusted that love God that would keep me accountable so that I didn't spin out of control, draw my sword, scream there can be only one and you know start lopping off heads. And so I needed people that would hold me in check. I needed people that would you know my dad, Calvin. Jim Kays. I have a list of saints that love God, that know God's Word, that I trust. I trust them more than I trusted myself at that point. I, I knew that my call was to be faithful, and beyond that, I needed somebody that would hold my feet to the fire. People that I could call and say, this is what I'm addressing this week. Am I right? Am I wrong? What am I missing? You need to have people that will walk with you in the deep, dark valley, that will come alongside you and companion you, will pray with you, will, will give you wise, honest, godly counsel, that will come on and offer you comfort. There's comfort in this. I found tremendous, by the way, I found it liberating and comforting when I would call these people of God, they would minister to me, and all of a sudden I could say, I'm where I'm supposed to be doing what God wants me to do. That, my friends... Is what they call joy. Last thought. What is joy? Joy is in the midst of the storm. God looking down, smiling, saying, you're my child and I'm good. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. And you, in the midst of the storm, can experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. Is that awesome? Oh.